Hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the last thinking on Sunday for our summer season. Um, if you're just here for Beverly's talk, that's that's totally fine. Um, we, but so, you know, we run fortnightly talks and then Conway Hall have been running talks since before Conway Hall existed every Sunday morning. And a few years ago, we moved them to uh, Sunday afternoons so we could get more people in basically. Hello Peckham. Um, so, We've been doing these online since April, um, probably will continue into the autumn, I'm not sure yet. Um, recently we've been cover covering, uh, recently we've been covering subjects such as uh, the history of blasphemy, uh, the idea and what we think about when we think about our brain and how museums can uh, look up, sort of look to their colonial pasts and make reconciliations for that. It's a broad subject covered by uh, the Conway Hall and our, our mission is to bring talks to people that promote ethical thought and thought in general, hence the name Thinking on Sunday. Um, if you are of a twittering disposition, do please uh, tweet about the event on hashtag Thinking on Sunday. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before uh, we start with Beverly's talk, uh, that the talk will go for about 40 minutes or so. People always give a time, people always give a time and then uh, go a little bit longer but we'll see how it goes today. Uh, then we'll um, have a Q&A session. There is a, at the bottom of your screen you should be able to see a Q&A bubble, please type the questions into there and let us know whether you'd like your microphone opened or not so you can ask your question live. Um, don't worry, you're all muted, uh, we will unmute you if you're okay with you being unmuted for a question. Um, that's the housekeeping. So uh, today I celebrated my sense of failure by uh, drinking at lunchtime and playing Pokemon Go. Um, I don't know what, what everyone else has done. Um, and now I'm in my shed broadcasting. I'm gonna put a blue plaque on the shed saying that it was standing Conway Hall for a number of months. Um, we're really pleased to have Professor Beverly Clack coming to talk about how to live well despite a failure, a very Conway Hall subject. Uh, Professor Clark is the Professor of Philosophy of Religion at Oxford Brookes University and her biography says that she is fascinated in thinking about failure and is uh, currently thinking about um, ageing and death in the age of pandemic, as indeed I think we all are. Um, so do please welcome uh, Clap, however you wish to, uh, to Thinking on Sunday, Beverly Clack. Hi Beverly. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you to everybody for um, giving up their Sunday afternoons. I'm about to do that thing that I think happens in every single talk online, which is to say, can you hear me? Um, and I'm assuming everybody can. Can you hear me, Scott? That's most important. I can, you're loud and clear. And um, we're getting some Good. yeses in from the chat. So. Excellent, wonderful. Um, well, thanks very much for the invitation to talk about my book, How to Be a Failure and Still Live Well. Um, probably got the best title that um, I've had um, when it comes to writing books, so I'm um, very grateful to my uh, team at Bloomsbury for that. Um, the global financial crisis of 2008 formed the backdrop to its writing. What I'm finding interesting, however, is that since its publication in January of this year, some of the themes I write about in the book have taken on a new resonance in a time of pandemic. But I thought I'd start by saying something about the forces that led me to writing this book before moving on to the themes that I think might be quite helpful for us now. We might think that we know exactly what failure is. We might think of exams we haven't passed or tests that placed us firmly in the bottom of the class. We might think of relationships that haven't turned out the way we hoped, ending perhaps in separation or divorce, recrimination, even betrayal. We might think of careers that we haven't been able to pursue because we messed up an interview or because we simply didn't have the qualities necessary to fulfill our dreams. A whole range of disappointing, frustrating, even devastating experiences can be covered by that one word, failure. Now common to these experiences is a sense of responsibility. I, or perhaps more comfortably, you didn't revise well enough. I, you, didn't work hard enough. I, you, 
didn't prepare sufficiently. Now, it can be difficult to admit our failures and we can go to remarkable lengths to avoid owning up to them. Lying on a CV might be one radical response. Pushing responsibility for a failed project onto someone else might be another. We might well prefer to focus on that to which failure acts as a shadow and that's success. There's something much more positive about this idea, not least the fact that it encourages us to pay attention to our talents and skills. But perhaps the problem with thinking primarily about success is that it ignores something important that's wrapped up in the idea of failure. And it's this that I want to explore. Too many authors, it seemed to me as I set about writing the book, thought about failure in purely personal terms. Invariably, it was written about as something that they'd managed to overcome. Instead, I wanted to think a little more carefully about the construction of failure, why we might prefer to push it to the margins, and why, if we pay attention to it in a little more detail, we might come to different, arguably better ideas about how we might live, not just as individuals, but also as a society. Now, it's one thing to identify failure as a neglected theme. Why did I want to write a book on failure? Academics and academic philosophers in particular might like to think that they arrive at themes in a detached and objective way. This, I think, is a little misleading because invariably we write what we write because something about our theme speaks powerfully to us. For me, a complex set of reasons led to my fascination with failure. Some of those reasons were rather trivial. Um, I'd failed to complete a book that would have lent me a great deal of academic credibility. Now, if any of you are academics, you'll know the extent to which you're only as good as your last publication. Faced with my personal development review, um, a series of words that strikes terror into the hearts of many of us, uh, faced with that review with my research manager, I felt I needed a response to the fact that I'd failed to finish a book that I'd committed to writing. My manager was clearly disappointed that I wouldn't be publishing a major monograph. So what are you going to write, he asked. I'm going to write a book on failure, I answered, feeling very much like one as I said it. So much for the off-the-cuff answer. Other reasons that demanded the writing of such a book were far more intimate, and they were reasons that suggested a profound link between experiences of loss and feelings of failure. And it's the connection between failure and loss that dominates the book. What do I mean by loss? Loss indicates the inevitable reality of being mutable beings in a world subject to the laws of entropy. We're born, we grow, we develop, yet we also inevitably decline, age and die. We lose our capacity. We move from strength to weakness, health to illness, life to death. Our relationships and ourselves are subject to forces far greater than ourselves that mean our lives are always subject to change. Loss is inevitable, outside our control. Failure suggests the possibility of control. If I work hard and revise hard, I can pass my exams, though of course much depends on the questions that actually appear on the paper. I can work at my marriage, thus lessening the possibility of divorce, though much depends on my partner's willingness to do the same, as well as the vagaries of longing and desire. Now, these examples suggest something of the tenuous possibility of being completely in control of one's own destiny, of being able to shape the extent to which one is successful in the many challenges of life. Much is uncertain because we're social beings who never act in isolation. Faced with the unsettling reality of our lack of control, we might well prefer to emphasise our responsibility, assuming success and failure to be things that we can control. It was the experience of loss that pushed me towards the investigation of the connections between loss and failure. 
In 1999, I miscarried what would have been our first child. This was a traumatic experience. I lost a lot of blood and was lucky to escape with my life. Courses of IVF and attempts at adoption followed. None were successful. Eventually, we had to accept that we wouldn't be parents. These painful, disappointing events led to an experience that is common when we run up against the reality of loss and the limits of our control. Loss morphed into a sense of failure. Now, of course, I wasn't responsible for these losses, but I felt I'd failed in my ability to give birth to a child. More than that, I felt I'd failed as a woman. As I explore in the book, to fail as a woman is to become aware of the transient nature of the things that often form the bedrock for shaping female identity, motherhood, physical beauty, youth. The experiences of loss and failure aren't as discreet as we might wish them to be, something I learned from that deeply upsetting set of experiences. Now this felt connection between loss and failure turned out to be very helpful for the development of my ideas. Now not everyone will have experienced the loss of a child or the dream of parenthood, but turning loss into a form of failure is evidenced in some of the language surrounding other experiences that bring us face to face with the limits of human control. Think for example of the language of winning and losing, which is often applied to the experience of severe or chronic illness. You win or you lose the battle with cancer. The implication is that you are a winner or a loser in the struggle with mortality. The relationship between failure and loss revealed something of the difficulty we have acknowledging human limits. And it was that notion of limits that I was to return to again and again when thinking about what makes for a meaningful life, if you like, what makes for a life that is valuable in the face of failure and loss. Now, another aspect of failure that I wanted to explore arose from my experience of being made a professor. What should have been a moment for satisfaction and celebration quickly deteriorated into a sense of dissatisfaction. I felt that I was writing because I had to meet the requirements of the modern university, not because I wanted to write what I was writing. I felt like a fake who was simply going through the motions. The failed book I referred to at the beginning of this talk was an example of this disjunct between what I felt was important and what I was actually writing. I gave up on that book because I literally had no idea how to write it. I would sit at the computer, stare at the screen and know that I had absolutely nothing to say. To give up on that book felt like another failure. It wasn't so much that the book was a failure, but that I had failed. Now, this is far from an isolated experience, and the psychoanalyst Stephen Gross alerts us to the complex relationship between failure and success. Success, he notes, can be experienced as failure, for, in his words, winning is also losing. Now, this might sound paradoxical to us, winning is also losing, but the story he uses to illustrate this claim resonated with me. One of his clients, an architect, had won a competition that would take him to China. Heading out to celebrate, he lost his wallet. The evening descended into farce, and far from feeling elated, Gross's client ended it feeling depressed. Gross's reading of this strange turn of events is interesting. With success comes the prospect of a new life, but not necessarily a better life. In losing his wallet, his client was expressing his fear that amongst all the money he was now to make as a result of this new venture, he might find he had lost himself. The implication of Gross's story is that it makes sense to pay attention to losing. Returning to my experience, it was the feelings of failure and the dissatisfaction that came with achieving promotion that opened up one of the most important stages of my life. I felt that I wasn't living as I should. Something was lacking. This period of dissatisfaction coincided with the aftermath of the global financial crisis. 
in the UK, this crisis became the justification for a new age of austerity. Don't we remember that well, even though we're often told that we have to forget about austerity now, we don't need to think about it ever again, thank goodness. Um, outraged by the cuts to public services that this entailed, and remember this was back in sort of 2010, 2012, um, I got involved in politics for the first time. After my fair share of demos and activism, I was eventually elected as a local councillor for Oxford City in 2012. Being involved in practical politics had a massive impact on how I started to think about failure and indeed success. I started to read these hitherto individual experiences politically. As I took up my seat in the council, I was no longer an individual working at my own success or struggling with my own failures. Now I was part of a collective that was working to change things. The variety of backgrounds of my fellow councillors still strikes me. We might have come from different walks of life, we might have been of different ages, ethnicities and from different economic groups, but in the council we came together in the attempt to hold on to the things our community needed in the face of cuts from central government. There was little room for ego, which wasn't to say it was entirely absent, obviously. More significantly, however, there was a shared commitment to work together to achieve a broader set of political goals. Now, all this might sound very romantic. I'm sure if I'd looked beneath the surface, I'd have found a host of motivations, not just the altruistic. But the framing of these motivations wasn't about achieving individual goals. It was about working for something bigger than ourselves. And I think that actually becomes quite a crucial theme for me, that idea of working for something that's bigger than ourselves. My attitude to my work as a lecturer and a researcher changed. My struggles with my sense of failure seemed rather pe petty and frankly self-indulgent. The ward I represented was one in which I'd lived for 20 years, but I was quickly realising that alongside the wealth and privilege of this gentrified area, there was poverty and limited life chances. That was the case even in as apparently rich a city as Oxford. These were the things that required my attention, not my own personal ambitions. Now, I hope that from that set of personal stories, you're getting a sense, not just of me, but of how that theme of failure might be connected to much bigger questions of how we might live well. Now, the move from the philosophical to the political mirrored another shift in my thinking. I became convinced that to write about failure as something purely personal, perhaps through exploration of themes like responsibility or shame, wouldn't actually be enough. There was a political dimension to failure that also needed to be addressed. This led me to explore a powerful contemporary narrative for how we should shape the meaningful life. Over the last 40 years, neoliberal theory and the economics to which it gives rise has framed the meaning of life in terms of being a success. This image of the well-lived life builds upon the account of human being formulated by the thinkers of the European Enlightenment of the long 18th century. Then the individual was conceived as rational, autonomous, free, capable of choice. Now this rational and responsible individual is placed in a specific economic setting. Your destiny is shaped by your ability to make rational choices about your life in a marketplace. In societies shaped by this new form of liberalism, the realm of the economic extends into every area of life. You are a choosing subject and your ability to choose is shaped principally through your ability to purchase and consume the material goods deemed necessary for a good life. Tracing the history of neoliberalism and particularly the role given to work in enabling personal flourishing revealed for me the pressures that have come to shape our lives. What matters according to this narrative is being able to show oneself to be a success. 
much can be sacrificed on the altar of this success. Think of me trying to write a book that will show I am worthy of the title professor rather than writing the book that I want to write. Status and importantly wealth come to be seen as the basis for the well-lived life. In order to become a success, you must utilize your talents and skills to the best advantage. If you fail to succeed, that must be down to your personal inadequacies. Little attention is paid to the social structures that enshrine inequality. Little attention is paid to considering ways of challenging, resisting and reshaping such structures. Instead, we're encouraged to place our faith in the market as the neutral arbitrator of value. The market will sort the wheat from the chaff. If you're poor or unemployed, the implication is that it's your fault. You aren't a victim of economic forces beyond your control, but you're responsible for your fate. In the best case scenario, training might be offered to help you become the kind of worker required by the contemporary workplace. In the worst case scenario, you might find yourself vulnerable to the casual cruelty that Philip Morosky describes as an aspect of what he calls everyday neoliberalism. The poor and the unemployed are no longer treated as classes. Instead, they're presented as feckless individuals, easy targets for the fury of hardworking others. They are the failures and responsibility for that state resides solely in their own hands. There is then a brutality attending to neoliberal judgments of what makes for the successful life. The result of the general election in December 2019 suggests that people may have had enough of this model. Now, whether the new nationalism of Boris Johnson's Brexiteer government will deliver on the promises to level up British society that won them that election remains to be seen. Um, it will doubtless prove much harder to shift the understanding of human life that sits beneath neoliberal economics. We're seeing that already as the government attempts to get our service driven economy back to normal. Get out there, start buying stuff, visit restaurants, drink in pubs, seems to be the message. Economic considerations are at the heart of neoliberalism. Everything can be financialized. The market extends itself to all domains and activities, even where money isn't the issue. And this isn't just about institutions, this also affects how we think about ourselves. As, me, as the sociologist Wendy Brown puts it, we're all framed exclusively as market actors, always, only and everywhere as homo economicus or economic man. Nothing lies outside the financial and that includes ourselves. We are economic men and women. We are homo economicus. Now, we might well feel that the government's focus on getting the economy up and running is justified. What I want us to think a little more about are the consequences of reducing all human life to the economic. If anything, this pandemic has revealed the paucity of this vision of human being. Far from being atomistic individuals obsessed with attaining our own individual successes, we are, I think, realising just how much we need each other. As we emerge from lockdown, we might well ask whether the current model for the flourishing life is good enough. Now, thinking again about how we might live is an extremely difficult thing to do. After all, the last 40 odd years have been dominated by that vision of human beings as isolated units determined to achieve at the cost of everything else. If we're to break the hold of a narrative that describes some as successes and some as failures on the basis of how much they earn or what they possess, we'll need a new vision of what it is to be human. The narratives of nationalism provide for some the answer. 
I want to suggest an alternative, one peculiarly well suited to a post-COVID world. Now it's at this point that we realise the problems with doing online lectures because I can just hear my cat scratching at the door here so I'm going to let him in and then I'll come back. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's the joy of um, doing everything from your home. We, we had a talk two weeks ago a little bit longer that was interrupted by a dog trying to get in so i'm glad the cats are getting in too <laughs> um before we go much further i suppose i should say that in the day job i'm a philosopher of religion that's what pays the bills what feed, keeps the cat in cat food and enables me to buy new shoes to replace the wet ones that are sitting in the garden um it might well be that fact that i'm a philosopher of religion that um, is going to explain why I'm going to talk a little bit now about why I think a particular framing of the religious might be able to challenge that economic model of the self. Now, if neoliberalism structures human beings as homo economicus, economic man, um, the model I advance in the book is homo religiosus or religious human being. Now, to start talking about religion might seem something of a jump from my description of getting involved in the collective working of local politics. However, there is something about the religious that if we can put aside our preconceptions of what the religious involves might enable an account of human being to emerge that builds on the appreciation of collective action that destabilized my individualistic ideas of failure and success. One of my favourite philosophers is uh, the 19th century uh, maverick, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, not because I particularly agree with him, usually I disagree with him, but I think he's a fascinating writer. And one of the things that Nietzsche says is that there are times when we must do philosophy with a hammer. Um, quite a violent image, that one. Um, and perhaps that flies a little bit in the face of some more considered philosophical discourse that we might have. It's difficult, however, I, um, to find a better reason for why I felt the need to offer homo religiosus or religious human being as an alternative to homo economicus than that. Um, I think the categories shaping economic man are extremely difficult to shake off. Debates on any aspect of life invariably end up with questions of economics. How much will it cost? How can you measure that? What financial benefit will accrue? Uh, Richie Sunak may have been throwing money about in the face of the COVID pandemic, but I'm not sure that these questions are entirely redundant for him either. The recent announcement that any bailouts to struggling universities would depend on their managers agreeing to focus on the subjects perceived to get students well-paid jobs is hardly encouraging. Clearly the purpose of education cannot be understood as something lying outside the economic. Can anything lie outside the economic if that's the case? I think we need a vision of human life that's so shocking that it shakes us free of the belief that only in the economic is the meaning of life to be found. This account of the human must be so strange that it forces us to consider the possibility that it needn't be like this. It must disrupt our assumptions about life. It must shake us to the very foundations of our being. Now, how much more shocking could an image be to those of us living in a secular society than one which claims we are as human beings fundamentally religious. Yet the strangest thing about this idea of religious human being is that if we shelve our assumptions about what it means to be religious, an approach emerges that reflects much more accurately, I think, than homo economicus, the conditions which shape human individuality and which show the importance of relationship for the human animal. An etymological uh, study of that phrase homo religiosus suggests why it might indeed be such a helpful idea. We're beings born of the earth, beings who are religious. 
Um, there's a much disputed but evocative definition that connects the word religion to the Latin religare. Uh, this means literally to bind. What we have in religion, if we follow this through, is the attempt to bind ourselves or to connect ourselves, to bind ourselves again to the world and to others. Under this reading, religious practice, its rites, its beliefs, attempts to reconnect human beings to the world beyond themselves. We're dependent on the world out of which we have been created. But there's also the suggestion here that we aren't entirely at home in this world. We need to connect to it again. For St Augustine, the desire for connection comes out of the feeling of disconnection. In a very famous quote, he says that our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Now, Augustine's words suggest that we need to discover some way of being at home in a world that is not entirely amenable to our desires. Sigmund Freud might have been a hostile commentator on religion, but he shares with Augustine the sense that human beings must find ways of being at home in the world. For Freud, ritualistic behaviours are part of the more general human attempt to make the world feel more homely. Unlike Augustine, Freud aligns religious behaviours with superstition. Rituals like prayer can be reduced to the same status as touching wood or crossing your fingers. Prayer, like superstitious actions, is, he says, an illusory attempt at making the world feel safe. What makes Freud's intervention interesting, however, is that he doesn't confine the desire to reach out to a world that threatens us as something which is only the preserve of the explicitly religious. Here's an anecdote from Freud's Psychopathology of Everyday Life that makes this explicit. One of Freud's daughters had recovered from a life-threatening illness. As he walked through his study, he yielded to a sudden impulse, hurling one of his slippers from his foot and causing a beautiful little marble Venus to fall down from its bracket. Finding himself strangely unmoved by this attack of destructive fury, as he puts it, he sees it as serving to express a feeling of gratitude to fate, which allowed him to perform a sacrificial act, rather as if I had made a vow to sacrifice something or other as a thank offering if she recovered her health, he says. Now that final sentence ends with an exclamation mark, rather as if I had made a vow to sacrifice something or other as a thank offering if she recovered her health, exclamation mark. Clearly, he's somewhat embarrassed by this action. Yet what we see here is the understandable and entirely human desire to reach out to something in order to express thanks for a daughter's recovery. Freud suggests that the desire to control is the basic human motivation behind an action of this kind. We're trying to make the world conform to our wishes. We're trying to instigate a kind of control over the forces that would crush us. Now, I think that example and his ideas might actually be interpreted slightly differently. In superstitious actions, there's the sometimes desperate desire to reach out beyond the self, to connect with that which lies outside ourselves and outside our control. And this desire for connection does more than just point up human weakness or fallibility. It also tells us something about the things we need in order to flourish. Let's just return for a moment to the neoliberal understanding of the individual. So in other words, the kind of account of the individual that we're so used to in our society. We're viewed under that account as fundamentally self-reliant and independent. We can make of ourselves what we will. It's this ideal that gives rise to the notion that success is crucial for the well-lived life. I'm to stand out from the world and from others. I'm to avoid failing in this fundamental task of self-creation. 
What this image doesn't engage with is what figures as different as Augustine and Freud point out. We're not in control of our lives in every respect. We can't be reduced to atomistic individuals who are radically separate from Earth and others. We need something more in order to flourish. And what is that something more? We need connection with the other, be that other, other people, or the world itself. And it's because it points up the need for connection that this idea of religious human being is, I think, so promising. I now want to think a little about how this might relate to the challenges of a post-COVID world. We've come rather a long way from my initial interest in failure, so perhaps let's pull ourselves back to that theme and particularly that conflation of failure with loss. If thinking about religion in the way that I'm suggesting might flag up the human need for connection, what might it mean for how we think about experiences of failure and loss? Now, for economic man, this model that I'm trying to overthrow, these experiences have very little to recommend themselves. Failure should be avoided, or if that isn't possible, it should be used as the foundation for future success. We're to learn from our failures. Heaven forfend that we should just fail. Losses like bereavement are viewed as unfortunate and we do well to get over them quickly. If we don't, we might be seen as weak or even boring. What happens if instead we spend time with these often painful experiences? Can they help us to think differently about what it means to be a human being? Um, what might happen to our visions of society if we started with an awareness of ourselves as fleshy beings who hope, love, fear, desire, make mistakes, grieve, suffer and die? We're human beings who need each other and to start by acknowledging this fact might well challenge ideas of what it means to fail and to succeed. Our experience of the last few months might confirm the necessity of this new starting point. Some of the deepest held prejudices of our society have been challenged by the reality of living through a pandemic. Those often considered to be of little value, shop workers, care workers, nurses, refuge collectors, child carers, cleaners, delivery men and women, teachers, um, have been shown to be the key workers without whom we cannot survive. The virus is challenging not just our personal lives but also the political world. On the one hand, not being able to hug or touch or be close to another person has made us realise how much we need physical contact. On the other, it's revealed just how much our individual health is dependent on the health of others. I think it's telling that the US, which has no national health service, can't seem to get on top of the spread of the virus. Perhaps it's because there isn't that acknowledgement that our individual health is always dependent on the health of others. We're being taught, I think, an important lesson. We need each other if we're to live well. And that knowledge should shape our politics and our social policies, as well as our own lives. It's not just our relationships with each other that need to be put right. Covid has forced us to realise that we must correct our relationship with the other animals and plants with which we share this planet. We were shown the reality of the effect our actions have on the natural world in the early days of lockdown. As we stayed home, the air became clearer, nature more noticeable, birdsong louder. We know that our actions are killing the planet. We need a different way of engaging with the world around us. So acknowledging our need for connection isn't just about our relationships with others. We need to connect with the universe, with nature, with what some of us might call God. We need to decenter the self, placing our lives and our concerns in the wider framework of the world around us. Now it's at this point that a different way of thinking about loss and failure emerges. Far from being aberrations that must be overcome, they emerge as experiences that have the power to make us think again about life. They unsettle us. They disrupt the ordinary flow of things. The 20th century theologian Paul Tillich puts this powerfully in his Shaking of the Foundations. It's only when 
the picture that we have of ourselves breaks down completely, he says, only when we find ourselves acting against all the expectations we had derived from that picture, and only when an earthquake shakes and disrupts the surface of our self-knowledge that we're willing to look into a deeper level of our being. Experiences of loss and failure, the experience of this pandemic too, open up the possibility of looking beneath the surface of our lives. A place is opened up for pausing, for thinking again about what exactly gives our lives meaning. This was the possibility that came out of my loss and my sense of failure. I had to look beneath the surface of my presentation as a successful academic. I had to find a different way of thinking about my life. Now in the book, I suggest connection with others as one answer to the troubling nature of failure and loss. We stop thinking about ourselves and think about others instead. But there's a broader connection to the universe too that I felt offered an answer to the problem of living. It's very difficult not to put ourselves at the centre of the world. Indeed, we're encouraged to do this by the consumerism that drives our economy. No wonder our failures can seem so overwhelming. No wonder we feel crushed by our losses. What happens if we resist the pull to make ourselves the centre of the world and reorientate ourselves, placing our lives and our concerns in the context of a much bigger frame. In the book, I write about the experience of the desert as a place which enables us to put our stuff in its rightful place. The desert landscape isn't pretty. It's not easily definable or accessible. It's not something that can be reduced to a postcard or a fridge magnet. As a result, it challenges any attempt to shape everything around the human. It punctures human pomposity. It strips away those things that we hide behind in order to show our importance. For geologist and theologian, Belden Lane, one initially enters the desert to be stripped of self, purged by its relentless deprivation of everything once considered important. The desert has no concern for us and our problems, and Lane sees this as ultimately therapeutic. The desert forces us to put our problems in their rightful place. He gives this example, uh, these are his words. Imagine this exchange in the desert silence. You find yourself alone in a vast and empty terrain, standing before a naked wall of red-hued rock, rising hundreds of feet above the canyon floor. The stone never moves as you sit there facing it. But after a while, it poses a question. How did the stone face of the canyon wall change on the day of your divorce? The day your father or mother died? The day you came to admit your dependency on alcohol or drugs? The answer comes back, it never changed at all. This knowledge, says Lane, brings with it the realisation that you, your life, your joys, your sorrows, your failures, your successes, aren't the centre of the world. Now we might find that a scary thought. Lane argues that if we think about it a little bit longer, it offers a kind of liberation. We're not as important as we think we are, and thank goodness for that. Now, we may be very far from the desert, but we too can put ourselves in the context of a greater whole. In the book, I suggest walking or being with nature is offering a way of reconfiguring life. In walking, we find a place where we can begin to accept our failures, to embrace our losses. In the early days of lockdown, it was walking that provided solace for me in the midst of the general and indeed individual anxiety that came with that experience. There's a park at the end of my street, which I would largely taken for granted over the years. Now it became literally a godsend. I'd get up at dawn, head for the park, and take in its stillness as the sun came up and life slowly returned. I found myself paying attention to it in a way I never had before. 
I noted the subtle changes as spring shook off the last vestiges of winter. I took note of the slow coming out of the blossom as March turned into April. Paying attention to that blossom reminded me of the playwright Dennis Potter's reflections on the fragile blossom outside his bedroom window. In the final stages of terminal cancer, the passing beauty of the blossom called him to participate in what he called the nowness of everything. He knows he won't see the blossom bloom again, but rather than feel despondent this is so, this knowledge brings with it new wisdom. Here are his words. Things are both more trivial than they ever were and more important than they ever were, and the difference between the trivial and the important doesn't seem to matter. The fragile beauty of a constantly changing world that will be there long after he is gone puts everything in perspective, even the imminence of his own death. Now in Dennis Potter's appreciation of the blossom, we have a very literal example of what it means to be brought to our senses. What an often misread and misunderstood phrase this is. This isn't about accepting a grim realism that forces the rejection of hopes or dreams. Forget the claims that it's in money or status, the things we acquire and accumulate, that sense is to be found. Forget the failures that haunt us. Forget the losses that pain us. In the vision of Blossom, we're brought to our senses. We see what really matters, and it's the Blossom's beauty, its gentle scent, the touch of its soft and fragile blooms, the sound of the wind in the boughs from which it springs, the taste of the fruit which will eventually grow out of it. Here is life in all its fullness offering us an intimation of our connection to a world that is so much more than we are. The senses tell us all this, if only we would pay attention to them. Now we might well feel cheated by this talk. We might feel that we've not spent nearly as much time as we thought we would on the themes of failure and loss, but perhaps that's the point. When we place our lives in the context of the universe that lies outside of ourselves, when we are jolted out of our status quo by those painful experiences of failure and loss, we have an opportunity to look at the world differently. We can see ourselves not as somehow apart from the world and each other, but as part of all that is. The only real failure is the failure to respond to each other and the planet with respect and with care. As we imagine a world after COVID, we could do no better than to start from the losses and the failures that make us human and whose revelations of fallibility bind us to each other and to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Um, that was. Uh, the cat's still we, trying to get in, so I better just let him in again. We would really like to see the cat if we can, oh, I believe. I think the cat's gone. <laughs> okay, okay, well. Um, I felt that went really well, thank you. Um, um, and we're glad the cat got to participate. Like I said, we nearly got a dog in a, a couple of weeks ago in a talk about UFOs. Uh, we oh, do have some. Um, uh, it's, it's all going on here, I swear. Um, <laughs> right, so um, we've got some questions. Uh, we've just invited Ro Rona to ask her. She got in early. So, Rona, can you, are you able to speak? Yes, I'm certainly able to speak. Can everyone hear me? We can Hello. hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Um, I want to um, ask about the... Um, the topic uh, you were discussing with regard to um, the monetization and the, uh, the you know, basically a homo economicus uh, concept with regard to disabled people. Because yeah. um, it's my belief that as a disabled person, um, austerity was unnecessary. It, I see it as a political choice and the uh, banking crisis as an excuse to um, kind of wage a uh, political war against uh, people who are disabled, people who are vulnerable and 
in some ways, people unable to work, and uh, as a way of um, weaponizing it in, in, in the sense of making them feel um, responsible for things that they can't control and making them feel more like failures, more inadequate because of their um, so-called lack of economic productivity. Um, and, uh, you know, basically I've been a victim of that and it's only just been the last couple of years that I'm starting to uh, come out, you know, sort of realize what I can control and what I can't. Um, mm. So I'm just wondering if you could say a few words about, about yeah. that. Please. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Rona. That's a very helpful intervention. Um, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you when it comes to austerity. It was, I, I, t I mean, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I was a Labour councillor. This will come as no surprise to know that this is the, the view I took on it, really, that it was a politically motiv motivated attempt to break up um, public services, the public sector, um, and to uh, make money out of those things, basically. So, I, yeah, I'm totally with you there. I think the thing that um, I'm very pleased you've raised is, is the question of disability. Unmute now. I'm being who, invited to unmute. Oh, sorry. Um, and people who, who might be um, written off on the basis that they're somehow not contributing enough to society. And this, I think, is a really pernicious narrative that... Um, is it directed at disabled people, at elderly people? This idea that somehow, um, you know, these there are people who should be contributing more and aren't. And I think this is a really dangerous way of thinking about society. Um, one of the thinkers that I use in the book is Hannah Arendt, and she's really interested in this question of um, a proposed uselessness of people. And um, obviously, um, I say obviously, I mean, Arendt herself was somebody who had escaped, a Jewish woman who had escaped um, the Holocaust. And she was all too aware of um, this idea that there might be a category of people who were useless um, or redundant in some way. And I think it's a really dangerous thing. I think we all need each other. And I think this is such an important point that you raise. And I really think this is something that should be um, at the front and centre of every vision of what our society should be like so thank you very much yeah thank you rona thank you beverly um mark newbrook is now on un unmuted hi mark hi bev um uh, very interesting Hello. material very interesting material thank bev you. can you hear me uh yes you can yes, hear me. I can. yes. i yeah. just wanted to ask how would your proposals involving homo religiosus apply to people who have no religious response to the world at all and no relevant belief. Right. Yeah. And I suppose this again goes back to, and, I, and I'm, I'm sorry if this wasn't particularly clear. One of the things that I got really interested in is this more general idea of the need for connection. Um, I think that that is the bit that for me, it lies at the heart of whatever it is that religious people think they're doing. And I don't think you necessarily need to be religious to have that sense of connection. You know, it could be about family, it could be about your environment, um, your locale, you know, your more broader community. I suppose what I was trying to do was I was thinking, you know, we take all this stuff so much for granted this idea that you know what matters is you know being successful making money it's about the economy these are the questions that you always ask and i think particularly this um question of value you know um how much will it cost you know what are the financial consequences all of this stuff it's so much out there that it's almost become like a kind of knee-jerk response to how um, we should address any issue um, whereas I thought with the, the idea of religion, I think a lot of people will have quite a knee-jerk response to that, as in, you know, don't be ridiculous, this is about churches or temples or, you know, any of these things. And actually, I wanted to get at something else, which is why is it that we have this desire to connect with each other, to connect with place, and particularly the importance of place, that that's kind of almost beyond these kind of very specific manifestations of, um, of, of religious practice. But I still think there's something about this desire we have to connect. And that's the bit that I, I kind of want to keep pushing. Oh, excellent. Spiritual belief, not quite. Yeah, and that's interesting too. You know, is it something about a kind of spirituality that might be about how we connect? The word spirituality might be one that makes our teeth go on edge even more so than religion. Um, but I think it's something about this, this idea that we're not kind of detached from each other and that we're trying really hard to kind of connect outside ourselves um, and that perhaps the connection with the broader universe 
might actually be the thing that's most important. I mean, frankly, this isn't particularly new stuff. I'm about to say something that's again really you know please don't not buy the book on the basis of this but i mean it's it's the stoic vision that there's something about the nature of the universe and our place in it that we are if you like the thinking part of the universe and that we we partake of that kind of rationality in a way and i suppose those are the bits that i really wanted to explore but i appreciate what you say mark it might actually just put people off and that is i think a danger with it but well, um, well, that's given me a lot more to think about and i'm sure everyone else and, and thank you very much bev and i now must run but thank you so much oh well thank you very much for Thanks staying and listening thank you Thank you. Uh, we do have other other people. I want to unmute Graham Taylor, who is a perennial questioner at our talks. Oh, excellent. Um, Hello, Graham. Um, also, before Graham, while we're unmuting Graham, uh, Yasmina and also uh, Claire Hardiman both said it was great talks or well, a beautiful talk. So, Thank yeah, you. there's a lot of good excellent. feedback. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Again. That's comments. Those are the feedback I like, and the money will be in the post. Yeah. <laughs> are you with us? There we yeah, go. Um, I, I um, loved your bring... speech. It was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. It was oh, full thank of you. intrigue and uh, it, it took my mind to another level of, of thinking about um, the stages in which the brain goes through, through stages of loss and, 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 and failure. And that's where my question comes in because mm. um, I'm actually thinking to a person that's lost someone in society, do you feel it's kind of linked to religion in a way? Because do you feel that um, once someone loses someone, they can become rejected in their own personality and feel that failure come through because they've missed that person so much. And then do you think that they could turn to suicide because they seriously think that um, in the religious sense that, that they'll be going to, to share their time with their partner in, in society? Do you think this is a common feeling amongst many yeah. people? Yeah. I think I think that um, point that you make about um, what happens when people experience a significant loss and the extent to which we do or don't enable people to grieve and to really feel that loss and not be embarrassed by that loss and not be sort of treated almost as, you know, the person that you cross the road because you're thinking, oh, God, I don't know how I'm going to talk to this person about what's happened to them. Um, is there a way that we can actually be kinder to each other? Because I think that for me is one of the things that I think we need to work really hard at. So that the kind of situation you describe isn't one that happens, you know, that people don't feel that without that person that they've made that intimate connection to, there is no other place for them in the world. And I think that's why for me, when we start thinking about political issues, I think we do have to start thinking about how we can build flourishing communities where people do feel part of where they live. And that I think is quite hard because I think we are very used to a, an individualistic narrative that almost encourages us not to connect with each other, not to, you know, not to say hello to people. I'm always surprised. It's a kind of a little test I do because I'm a bit like my dad and my dad always talks to everybody he meets. I think he's probably quite irritating in many respects and I've managed to, um, to end up being a bit like him. And I'm always interested by responses because people either chat to you and they're like, oh yeah, that's great or people look horrified that you've said something to them because it's almost like you're breaking some kind of convention by speaking and um, I, I think that thing about how we talk to each other even just generally in the place where we live might enable people to not feel so lonely because loneliness is a terrible thing and I think often the kind of losses you're describing Graham are precisely the ones that that lead people to feel that kind of intense loneliness um, and there must, there have to be better ways of, of living together. I think that's one of the great things that the Joe Cox Foundation does, is it kind of develops on that, that work, that idea that actually by identifying loneliness as this kind of social ill, we really have to start thinking about how we connect with each other. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but it was a very interesting point you made, Graham. Thank you. Thanks, Beverly. Um, just to say, uh, Mark and Amory, who've got their hands up in the... Uh panel list attendee list um if you could just give us an idea of your questions in the in the question and answer section if you don't mind or in the chat do the question and answers so we can because we're going to the people who've actually typed in questions first and uh we're going to go to murphy um who has a question so oh also while murphy's unmuting oh hi murphy hello murphy hello um hello hello Murphy was suggested, I just went with it. Uh, first name's Martin. Um, 
Oh, right. Enjoyed okay, Mark. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Uh, enjoyed the talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Bev, thanks. It touched on a lot of my experiences and thoughts. But uh, the question is, has uh, Thomas Economicus been weakened by COVID-19? Very good question. Yeah, I, I, you know, I found it kind of fascinating initially, particularly watching a Tory government having to effectively um, operate a kind of Keynesian model of what government should do, particularly with money. Um, and it's, I don't know, my worry is that I think we're, we're, this idea of getting back to normal is such a fascinating and troubling idea. Because on the one hand, you can see why we might want to do that. We're very used to how things have operated. But I thought there was something in, in many ways quite beautiful about how we started to think about each other differently. And particularly the idea of, well, who are the people in society that we really need? Who are the people who hold our society together? And it was often people who were on minimum wage, possibly zero hours contracts. It was people who were doing these kind of, you know, menial jobs, but actually the jobs that were most important. And I really loved that recognition of that. I actually enjoyed the Thursday night clap because it felt like you were kind of coming together in something. My concern is that actually what that clap should have lent, lent itself to, which was actually paying people properly and respecting them and all the rest of it, and you know perhaps challenging things like contracting out and how people might feel that they're not part of a, an institution, like say the cleaners at my place or people who work in the canteen or whatever, that we would perhaps actually recognise that we all needed each other. Um, and I think what's sad at the moment is you feel that in this relentless push to get us back to some kind of economic stability through using all the same drivers, you know, go out and buy stuff. That's, that's you know, what we've got to do, um, that we're going to miss an opportunity. Now, I suspect in practice, the planet isn't going to let us do that. I think it's going to be much more difficult to get rid of this thing than we might think. Um, and so perhaps we are going to be forced to think differently about how we live, but I think it's going to take an awful lot of effort. And I do think we, that anybody who's interested in these sort of themes ought to be really pushing at this stage for um, a different way of thinking to emerge out of it, because otherwise I think we're just going to keep in this spiral and um, eventually I suppose the economy will just stall and we'll have to get on and do something different. But um, yeah, I think it's an important point you make where you raise Martin. And I, I, I hope that people do keep kind of pushing at this. Thanks. That was very long winded, wasn't it? As you've realised, I can't actually answer <laughs> the question shortly. This is a really bad habit. Sorry about that. That's, that's really surprising for a philosopher. Um, no, who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to read a couple of responses out before we go to Mark. Oh who, um, so Naomi has asked, I'm fascinated to discuss further the nature of connection and wonder if it would be possible to take it offline as I'm not able oh, to yes. type my thoughts readily, especially whilst listening so much. So is there a, way, is there a place you could be contacted? Yes, definitely. Um, for uh, further conversation. Is, is there, a, I don't know if anyone's got, if you've got, I mean, I'm a, you can email with pleasure, please, please email me. I'd be really happy to hear from you. Um, I'm not sure whether my email came out with this talk. Shall I just put it in the chat box? If you put, if you put your email in the chat or you can uh, type in, if you go into the Q&A box while I'm going through okay. another thing, you I'll can uh, reply to Naomi's question there, I think, yes. with your Thanks. email. Um, I'm also going to, because this, this touches home with me as well, uh, Helen commented a little while ago that I'd love to connect with people, but due to my asthma, I feel like a failure whenever I, whenever I try. Happy to take any suggestions. Yeah. Um. Sorry, look, this is me That's trying okay. to read I mean, things I'm... at the same time. Um, which I'll give you That's both it. of them. Um, um, oops, hold on, sorry. Just trying, this, is, this is a sign that I can't do more than two things at the same time. That's good. Sorry to be there. Okay, okay, excellent, sorry. Um, yeah, and I, I wonder as well whether there isn't a, a bit of an... This is what I was saying about, you know, with this thing of me saying hello to people in the park and the sort of responses you get, I can imagine that that must be much more stressful 
um, if you feel that you're not entirely sure that you're doing the right social cues. I've got a friend who's got um, Asperger's and he'll often say that that is the thing. It's this thing about not quite reading the, the cues in conversation. But perhaps if the rest of us were just a bit less uptight about how people talk to us. Um, I mentioned in the book actually a friend, um, well a, a, a chap who I used to meet um, on a regular walk around Christchurch Meadow who was a chap who used to sit there feed the ducks and he'd have his beer and he'd be you know just sitting there really and um, we, we just got to know each other pretty much over over that period but it kind of felt a little bit like a lot of people didn't like talking to him because it was almost like this idea that he was a bit odd you know why is he sitting there all day with his beer but actually if you got chatting to him you know you have a lovely conversation about you know what the ducks were up to what the weather was like and all of these kind of things and it just struck me that there's i think we all need to be thinking about how we communicate with each other perhaps you know, going back to martin's point it would be so nice if that became the basis of how we think about what it is to live together and perhaps it goes right back to rona's point as well that rather than hive people off who aren't worthy of our communication that perhaps we could actually start to be more more open and perhaps just more kind of casual not casual perhaps is the wrong word but more open to to that um yeah sorry that was a very long again very long that's great. Helen, I, uh, most of my family are ASD, Helen. Um, I, I do sympathise. Mm. I think we all need... ASD, I suppose people don't need to change. I think other people do, but ne never give up. Um, I'm going to unmute Mark, who had a question. I think it sort of follows on from the previous person that asked a question live. Hello, are Mark. You... Hello. Hello. Eating lunch. Good. <clears throat> um... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who can multitask. I mean, four o'clock in the afternoon. Eh? Well, late night, late morning. Um, so it follows on from Martin's question, I think. So you kind of talking about the the impact of coronavirus. Mm. Like during this time, the people that we've kind of turned to to keep things going have been the low paid. So people who've worked in supermarkets, um, some relatively low paid public sector workers. So the nurses, for example. But then to kind of keep ourselves sane, we've also turned um, quite a lot of us to the arts, whether that's mm. on Netflix or BBC iPlayer, um, or through kind of, certainly in my case and a lot of other people I know, watching individual artists on Facebook Live or Instagram or things like that. Mm. A lot of people, you know, they're not rolling in cash. Mm -hmm. so how confident are you, or kind of, are you feeling positive that actually, we will be able to, to turn around this idea of what is value instead of it being have you made a lot of money out of it into a more I don't know because almost like a more Millsian perspective around the greater good concepts. Yeah I think I've got I've got a lot of time for that as an idea. Um, I mean I think the arts are absolutely vital again you know what was what was the thing that was keeping a lot of us sane through this it was kind of arts and crafts um and I, it, it troubles me again that these are always the things that end up being pushed out you know so the, the throwaway sort of in, um comment i made about you know what's going to happen with failing failing universities um and that idea that you know when the government bails out universities they will only do that on the basis of are you offering jobs that are going to get people uh, uh, courses that are going to get people jobs um I find this such an appallingly reductive way of thinking about life and particularly what education might offer us, which for me is always that idea that education enables us to try out things and particularly to find things that through life might mean that we're, we're never going to be bored. And I think that's, I don't know, I think that's more interesting. Perhaps not never being bored. Boredom is probably quite important, actually. But, you know, it's going to give us an, opp you know, an opportunity to explore creativity, to think in these more connected ways that um, I'm interested in. So I think the arts are absolutely vital. But I, I fear that it's, it's the, the, the idea that these things are kind of add-on extras. Um, I, I fear that that's where the government might end up. 
um, as I say, because of that way in which they're thinking about education, it doesn't exactly make me feel confident that they're going to be recognising just how important these things are to human flourishing. That was um, a shorter answer. Look at that. <laughs> Please myself. Um, so I, I suppose if I may ask a follow on then. Yeah. Obviously we have government um, and I will have stories in the audience, but I too am a, a Labour member. Um, for whom kind of there is that argument around they know they that have my <laughs> and the value of um do you think this is more about us as a population then kind of recognizing this much more rather than looking to government leaders um yeah quite possibly i mean one of the things that i think is quite interesting about the lockdown experience actually is that if we, if you know, I, I got the impression that people had decided pretty much the week before lockdown was announced that that's what they were going to do. Um, I can remember, I think it was the, the speech Boris Johnson gave, which was a bit like, you know, go at home, don't go to home. Oh, that one. Um, and my university just immediately sent around an email saying, right, nobody's going to be in the building at a point when the government hadn't made that clear. So you sort of felt almost that government was being pushed into that um, rather than immediately going for lockdown and I wonder if that might be a clue to how things could potentially go that if people start wanting these things perhaps being more vocal but I mean it's going to take quite a lot of effort um, perhaps we could end up with something different I mean I think we are in a, in a, in a, a time where the possibility of something different is real it's just whether we're able to push things in that direction. And I have days when I'm feeling quite optimistic about that and days where I feel quite pessimistic. Okay, we're going to do, I think it'd be nice to wrap up by around half past four. Um, so we're going to have questions from Yasmina and Anne-Marie and then we might call it an afternoon. So Yasmina, okay. I'm going to come to you first to open the microphone. Okay. More, much more praise in the Q&A as well, Beverly, so check that out. Hi, Yasmina. Hello, can you hear me okay? Hello. Hello, Yasmina. Oh, hello, hi. Hello. Um, thank you for today's talk, by the way. It was, it was extremely interesting and um, made me feel a lot more positive, I guess, in a lot of ways. <laughs> so thanks. Um, so my question follows on from the previous one, actually. We to this idea of uh, oh, yeah. I also study arts um, and I wanted to uh, not necessarily just put you on the spot here but I wanted to know what kind of solutions or ideas you can think of for how we might counteract this you know this overt push from the government not just in terms of you know what universities are deemed bail outable um but you know we've had this huge push about stem subjects etc how can we literally on the ground push back and say you know there are other ways to education um there are other reasons for it being not just beneficial but necessary or exciting fun um what can what can we do you know other than you know sit feeling sour faced every time we hear you know for me anyway the tories uh, regard education the way they do what what can i what can someone like i do i think that's a very good question um so I think just off the top of my head, there are two things that are going through my mind as you were talking. Um, the first one was what's happening um, in terms of the preparation for next year um, in universities. And um, I found that quite, um, in some ways, quite dispiriting because we're effectively being micromanaged over how we're going to structure courses, the kind of content that students are going to get. Because um, I think in common with a lot of universities, my university are putting all our lectures online and then we're having seminars. So there's a fear that students won't feel they're getting value for money. Um, and I find that quite dispiriting as a model. But um, I teach one course called Thinking in Dark Times. And um, that's usually looked kind of at the political stuff and particularly the period um, 
of kind of the 1930s, 1940s. Um, and this year, half of that course is going to be thinking about the pandemic and how it might be challenging us about how to live. So there's that is my kind of subversion bit, um, where you can actually perhaps talk a little bit with students about about that and whether they feel that the models that they're being offered of what will make for a good life are actually the ones they want. In practice, it's easier in philosophy to do that, I think, because it's not it's not the kind of subject where you know you're not going to be able to perhaps subvert ways of thinking. It's you know that's quite helpful. The other thing though that did go through my mind when you were talking about being an arts practitioner, um, I chair a local arts organisation called Fusion Arts, and we're sort of trying to work out how to get up projects up and running, and we have got some projects going. And I think that role for arts in the community is really powerful actually, because I think it opens up possibilities to people um, for how they might actually find pleasure, enjoyment, meaning possibly in those kind of activities. And um, so I think there were two things there. There's a kind of subversion thing and then there's also um, the voluntary stuff. But I do think, as you say, it's this thing about we all have to kind of make a lot of noise about this stuff because I think the economic model is so powerful as a way of saying this this is what it is, this is what it has to be. And I think we need alternative visions, really. Yeah. Uh, it, but thank it you. It, it definitely feels very like a, a very poisonous model, you know, uh, being situated within a university. It's um, maybe I'm being too romantic, but it, it really does feel like it strips in every area. So many, you know, possibilities for why education. OK, yep we require jobs to live okay that's one side but what about the actual joy of getting lost in ideas of stumbling upon different ways of being of interacting why is you know why obviously we know why that's not crucial at the moment um but it's i don't know it just it feels very sad it feels mm. like such a, like we're, we're losing such a great opportunity yeah, I so think that's, right. that's my rant over. <laughs> no, well, I totally agree. I mean, please get in touch because I'd love to have a longer rant. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think, I, yeah, I think that's exactly it. I think that idea of getting lost in stuff is a wonderful thing. You know, mm. I think that's brilliant. And also those bits where stuff you do is a complete disaster. Usually, you know, that's not a bad thing. Right. So it's, it, well, it's, how, it's how you learn about what it is that you do like, isn't it? Or yeah. actually, I know I'm no longer this. So I've got a shimmy over here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jasmine. That was really, really nice. I liked that. Okay. Um, one more question. Uh, questions for a comment from Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie. She's just coming online. Hello. 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 Yes, hello. Um, I hello, Anne-Marie. Yes, hello. I just wanted to say you mentioned the desert. Um, I've been in a bit of a desert now for four and a half months. I've not seen a single human being in four and a half months. And because um, I'm shielding, I was a nurse and a midwife for nearly 40 years in the NHS. And um, this total isolation, if nothing else, has certainly concentrated the mind. And I have for many years, in fact, I've spoken about it at Cornwall Hall in the past, thought about success and this um, complete concentration of on individual success and indeed national economic growth and e economic success. And I've always wondered why we couldn't have a completely new concept of success in terms of the success in reducing suffering, reducing suffering of the world in general. Because for me, this is the biggest priority. And I think the connection with others to have a drive to reduce suffering in all its forms, including animal suffering, but obviously human suffering, to reduce suffering, if that began early in life and it was part of our education and part of our nurturing, that we would feel a sense of achievement and success in our connection with others in a drive to reduce suffering in all its forms, poverty, starvation, um, you know, equality, equal distribution. And I just wish this was a motivating connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it sounds a bit idealistic, 
but I do believe that if we didn't have this drive towards individual competition and gain and achievement and economic, you know, nationally as well, if we worked internationally to reduce suffering, because certainly as a nurse, I know that I've assisted many people in birth and in death. And when people are dying, the things that they've achieved in life matter not a jot. It's, it's the elimination of their suffering and their connection to others that mm. seems to always come to the fore, no matter what they've achieved in life. Mm. Yeah, and I just wonder you. whether you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, lots. I mean, that's, yeah, thank you very much. That's lovely. Um, the, I've been reading um, Albert Schweitzer quite a lot, and I've really found his ideas on uh, reverence for life as something that just seems such a powerful idea and such a simple idea in some ways. Um, and I think that's the bit that I kind of would like to sort of explore a little bit more is how a principle like that could be in, could become a pol something that's political in that, in that wider sense, you know, about how do we actually connect to each other? What are the policies we need for this? And the thing that, that I keep coming back to myself, and this is probably just because I'm in education, um, it's inevitable, but I do think the model of education we've got at the moment is just not fit for purpose. It's about somehow preparing people only for the workplace, not for life. And I think that's just a diminished understanding of what education can do. And um, I think that has to has to has to be at the forefront of things actually how do we how do we challenge some of those ideas that it's only through learning stuff that you're going to get a job that's just not good enough i think it has to be about something else and until we break that model i'm not sure that we'll be able to push it some of those other things but i, I thank you very much for that i found that a really helpful um set of reflections thank you thank you thank you Marie, and uh thank you professor it's been there. Uh... <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> that kind of cackle way, should I really? That's a great it. cackle. I like that. Some of my best friends are witches. And, it's, um, <laughs> and I always appreciate a cackle. Thank you very much for your talk, Beverly. That was uh, enlightening. And uh, someone in the crap chat said it was uh, humane, which oh. is something we definitely need a lot more of. So thank you for who has <laughs> said that. Thank you. And thank you for your talk. Um, well, thank you very much. Normally right now I'm going to be clapping and I'll be trying to get you down to the pub, but that's not the world we're in at the moment. <laughs> so I'm just going to say thank you very much. Um, oh, thank you. We look forward to hear, hearing from you again. And thank you everyone for attending. Com we're taking a break now from uh, online events until the 6th of September, possibly earlier, who knows. And we may be back at Conway Hall, but also webcasting. You may just be webcasting, I'm not sure yet. So. Uh, do please watch this space as in your laptop screen or computer screen, everyone. Thanks again, Beverly, and uh, yeah, good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.